Boeing 747-400, the queen of the skies. Welcome aboard for our cold and dark power-up tutorial. Greetings Sim Captains and welcome aboard the flight deck of our Boeing 747-400. This is the Laminar Default 744. So let's get started with our power up. We have a rather large overhead today. We are in three columns and they're set up pretty much like the rest of the Boeings, particularly if you're used to the 757 or 767, this style of switches is going to be much more familiar to you. So in the left hand column, we're going to start with the battery switch. It's about uh, a little above centered here. It's covered and we'll recover it. Battery on. To the right of the bat, oh sorry, the left of the battery, the standby power selector. Rotate it to auto. Next, we need to establish electrical power. We can either use the external power, which is available, as long as, uh, I believe if you're parked at a gate, engine shut down, that's going to show as available, even though there's no air cart feature to turn on and off. So let's turn that on. External power is on. Another option if you wanted. You could also fire up the APU now and use the APU as your power source. We're going to proceed though with this external power. Next, uh, exterior lights as required. At this point it would be logical to turn on the nav lights, so let's glance a little bit down to the lower lowest row of the panel. On the far right, right above the FO, is going to be our exterior lights. So we're going to click on the nav lights. That's your uh, red and green out in the wings. Let's people know that the uh, ship is manned and being prepared. Also, if it was nighttime, we might switch on the logo light for the tail. Uh, I'll turn that on now, even though it is bright and sunny out here at Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. Okay, next we want to turn on the no smoking signs and seat belt signs. Those are located in the center pedestal behind the throttle quadrant. So here we go. No smoking. I'm going to turn it to auto. Seat belt sign to auto. At this point, I'm going to jump up here to the FMC. And a quick note, we actually have three FMCs on the 744. There's the normal captains right there on the left. The first officers on the right but we have an extra center here. Uh, in the sim, these buttons are not actually functional, even though they show a click region. You'll notice nothing is happening. But the center screen repeats everything you put in here on the captain. So let me just click, uh, we're already in index. Let's hit flight plan, and jump down. You notice it is switched. Okay, look at the captains. One of the nice features of the default, you can click it up. If you click in the scratch pad, you get that blinker. At that point, you can use your keyboard. Now's a good time to enter a flight number. British Airways 288 is a flight from Phoenix to London Heathrow. And there's our iCal codes for the flight. That's really all we're going to do with this at the moment. So now I'm going to close this down. There will be more to set up later. Next, we're going to turn on the IRS mode selector. So back to the overhead panel. The IRS mode selectors are up 
above the batteries in the far left column. We're going to switch them directly to the nav center position, all three IRS selectors. Even though they're shown there, uh, uh, there's a number of features in this cockpit that are not actually simulated. Um, the switches might turn, so you can actually use a more extensive checklist, but they're not really operating anything. We turn those IRS selectors, and nothing's happening. The uh, FMC on this does not care in the slightest, so it's uh, partially simulated, we might say. All right, IRS mode selectors are on nav. Next are left and right utility switches. They're right here above the battery. Left and right utility on. After that are bus tie switches in uh, the row under the battery. We're gonna connect all four bus ties. Generator contactors is next, right under that. Again, all four on. Uh, moving down in that same column, we're going to go to the hydraulic engine pump switches. The selectors of the knobs leave those in off. The switches, the button switches, we will turn on. Next, we're going to turn on the window heat. We're going to go into the second column, down relatively near the bottom. Here is the window heat. Let's turn both of those on. Now we're going to activate the yaw dampers in the right hand column at the very top. Yaw dampers upper and lower, yaw dampers on. Next, our trim air switch. Just moving down a little bit in that column. We're getting into all of our air bleeds packs and other air functions. Here's trim air, trim air on. Recirculating fan switches, switch them on. Aft cargo heat remains off at this time. Pack control selectors, uh, we can switch these to normal on this checklist but uh, it's my understanding right now they're really not going to do anything there is no air pressure the APU is currently off because I'm using external power and I don't have an external air source so I'm going to turn this to normal but it's not really doing anything uh, the APU bleed air switch they're asking us to turn it on which is a little odd because we don't have the APU on and then next, the engine bleed switches. And I'm also going to connect the left and right isolation valves so that the uh, air can pass the whole way from the left to the right side. All right, now we're going back to the FMC this point you would want to put in your routing. I'm going to use the I think it's route menu. There we go. Company list. Yes. I have saved in here a flight. Here we go. KPHX EGLL01. That's the exported one from Simbrief just to save me a lot of typing. And you can see it's in there now. So we have put in our route. You can see there's no discontinuities at this time in the route. Um, next, selecting the departure. If you pull up ATIS, you can grab a departure. I flew this flight the other day. We did runway 8. I'm not actually planning to fly this right now, so I'm going to be a little lazy about checking, but I believe it was broke 1 to maxo. So you can see there an SEL, which means select. Execute is lit, meaning those are not active yet. Hit execute. ACT means they are now active. Go back to legs. We can check. You can see our standard instrument departure, our SID appearing click the next page 
there's no discontinuity maxo was the transition so blends in very nicely all right next we need to put in our cruise altitude crz is cruise uh, this trip is going to start out Oh, pff, pardon me. If you make an edit in the default FMC mid-flight, you need to input all the zeros. When you're inputting it into this cruise page, you put it in as a flight level would be red, just as 330. Later, we'll step to 350 and 370. All right, that is going to do for our basic FMC set up with the default. Next item on our checklist, a transponder code. If we had done some VAT sim or just use the uh, in-game ATC, or if you just want to make one up, here's your transponder. We're in the center pedestal on the right-hand side. and. Uh, the checklist says to turn it to this XPDR and you'll notice it only goes to on and there. You don't actually have the ability to spin it to uh, TARA. Alright, next our altimeter. Let's see if we're still set up for Sky Harbor. We're not. I'm not going to bother to pull up the ATIS, but you can set your altimeter here. As is the case with many of the Boeings. Once you set your altimeter, if you click STD for standard, it will snap to 29.92. You'll notice smaller underneath is still the old altimeter setting. That's really a preparatory, so if we're about to hit transition altitude on descent, I can go to the altimeter setting we want, and as we pop through the transition, Click standard and it snaps to whatever I input ahead of time, which saves you actively turning this, and you can see the altimeter reading is changing as we go, so it's not really preferable. So 2992, the first officers is not repeated. You will need to come over here and set this yourself, 2992 or whatever your current pressure setting is. All right, next, the flight directors can be turned on. We will leave the auto throttle off this time. Mode control panel, heading and altitude should be set. Our runway is runway 08. You can pull up the charts. Sometimes the headings are actually off by a few degrees, but generally speaking, uh, 080 should be runway 8. And your altitude, check for a first altitude. This uh, 1635, you're actually going to climb to 1635 before you turn if you read the departure on that. And then pretty much they have us climbing direct. Uh, if you're not doing that sim, you'll be able to do that yourself. I'm not actually going to take the time to spin this the whole way up to uh, flight level 330 for you, but that's where it is. All right, next, uh, mode control panel speed. We want to set our V speed here, and you can see your target speed shows up over here. The FMC, the default FMC, does not, unfortunately, if you're used to Zebo, does not calculate V speeds for you. All right, next, uh, our APU. Let's get that going. So we're back in the overhead panel. We're over here near the battery. To the right and up a little bit from the battery is the APU. You can hold it over to start. It's going to kick back on its own. There is an APU sound. This cockpit's a little disappointing that the switches make no sounds. The uh, seatbelt doesn't bong. There's 
that level of immersion is missing, sadly. Alright, our APU is on. Alright, we have completed most of our pre-flight checklist now. We're now at time for the before start checklist. So, back in our overhead on the left hand column, we're going to go back down to the hydraulic pumps area. We're going to turn the number four switch to auxiliary. It's the only one that has an auxiliary. Uh, hydraulic demand pump one, two, and three are going to auto. Alright, fuel pumps will be turned on as required. I think we've got about 16 here. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. 16 plus two cross feet switches. One of the cooler features, I'm going to turn on my cross feeds. Um, if we go over here where you can see your FMCs, the lower display has a number of functions that are right up here to the right of your uh, mode control panel autopilot functions. So right now we're in engine. I clicked it again so it went off. Back to engine. Stat. You can see your uh, rudder deflection. It's not actually going to move right now, is it? I'm going to assume there's no hydraulic pressure because none of these are moving. I just kicked the rudder and tipped the ailerons. Nothing happened. Oop, sorry. Easy on the viewpoints. Next, the electric is not simulated. The fuel gives you a beautiful fuel map. You can see all of your tanks. You can see the engines, you can see the uh, cross feeds. Here, let's go turn off the cross feed so we can see what that does. We'll turn off starboard cross feed to number four. And there you can see the cross feed valve is shut down and closed. Very nice chart. Uh, one thing that might bother you a little bit the fuel is reflected in kilograms. I believe a kilogram is about 2.2 pounds. So essentially, if you just want to eyeball this, double it and you'll have your fuel weight in pounds, roughly speaking. All right, hydraulic, uh, doesn't do anything. DRS gives us all of our door status. Uh, I do not believe the door is open on this. I haven't tried setting up a switch to do it, but walking down in the cabin, Clicking on the door didn't do anything. And you have gear. So, temperatures, pressure, gear doors open and closed. Uh, I'll be honest, I've never really looked at that during landing to see if I've been toasting the gear and the brakes. But it's neat that it's there. So I'm going to go back to engine because we're going to want to see this for engine start. All right, enough talking about that. Our pack control selectors, number two and three, are gonna get turned off. So we're back in the overhead. The packs are on the right-hand column. Turn off number two. Turn off number three. At this point, preparing for engine start, we're gonna turn on both beacons. We've got an upper and, oh, sorry, we have a both setting and a lower setting. So we're going to switch it to both. Next would be the pushback. So we use better pushback. Ground to cockpit. Please show me where you want to go. And there's a preset pushback here. Ground to cockpit. Tow is driving up. Starting pushback, and you may start engines.
All right, we have our clearance for engine start. All right, so going up to the overhead, we're going to select an engine starter, click on it, and you'll get this start light. Looking down, you will see the N2 compressor spooling up, and when we hit the magenta line, that is your start line, and then we can go back here and click the fuel control on engine number four to run. The fuel is introduced, you'll see the exhaust gas temperature rising. N1 starts creeping up. Our oil pressure is moving. There we go. You can see engine number four is on and running. All right, let's continue with our engine starts. Start number one. I'm going to turn that cross feed back on that I was playing with earlier. Watch for the magenta start line. Looks like that's about what, 15? 15 or 16? Turn on the fuel. Fuel control to run. Exhaust gas temperature is rising and one starting to come on up. So I understand that the APU on the real 744 is fantastically powerful, and I believe it can actually start more than one engine at a time. Uh, it may just be that the sim is either... Operation complete. Go ahead and set the parking brake. Thank you. Sorry, let's do that. Here's your parking brake. Kind of the Disconnecting spot. tail. Stand by. Uh, as I was saying... <laughs> We're going to try starting two that at the simultaneously. That's either extremely accurate or just very forgiving uh, programming by Laminar. You can see both spooled up at the same time. I guess in theory we would have pressure from the other engines at this point anyway. Get rid of our tug. There we go. Our N1s are stabilizing. Go on out and have a look. Alright, engines are running. Next, says uh, APU as required. I think now is actually an acceptable time to shut down the APU. So I'm going to take the APU bleeds off. Shut the APU on. So is disconnected and bypass pin has been removed. Hand signal on the right. We'll see you next time and have a safe flight. Uh, I'm going to mention something now that I don't really recall if we started the APU before pushback or not, but I really should have had the APU generator on when we pushed back prior, prior to disconnecting the external power, which you might recall I didn't actually disconnect. Uh, in the process of pushing back we would have been ripped from it had we not actually unplugged it and uh, in the real bird you would have lost all of your programming and just generally speaking problems. So sequencing wise make sure you have the APU running and the APU on bus with this APU Gen 1 switch before pushing back. Alright let's pick up with our list. We're going to go to those hydraulic demand pumps. We're going to take the number four out of auxiliary and move it up to auto with the rest. Now we can turn off our aft cargo heat, go to the third column. It's over here by your recirculators. Aft cargo heat is on. 
auto brakes need set. That's down in your pedestal on the FO side behind our transponder. RTO is your uh, reject takeoff. Flaps need set for takeoff. And you will notice the flap display is here. Alright, flap transit is done. We're at flaps 5. Alright, next up, stabilizer trim. We're just going to check that. It normally defaults at startup to uh, kind of middle of the road. You can see we're in the green band for takeoff and landing. That's fine. Before taxiing, we're going to turn on some taxi lights. So here we go. Here's a taxi light. You'll also note we have runway turnoff lights, that's also for taxiing purposes. And your landing lights inboard and outboard are there. Uh, before we continue, let's turn on some internal lights. On the far left, this storm on is basically a uh, it's basically a full dome light. You'll actually notice this dome switch. Uh, it's a bright sunny day, you won't see right now if we were in the dark. It would light up the entire cockpit right now. Uh, check backer overhead panel. This is the back lighting for the upper overhead panel. Let's see how bright we made it there. I actually prefer it blindingly bright. Glare shield panel and flood. That's down here. Uh, the panel is the rear one. Again, I like things bright, so let's run that up. Our mode control panel, you notice all of our backlighting is on. Nice little glow in the uh, digit displays. Okay, the dome light, you've already sort of seen this. Uh, by the way, this outer knob is for the front lighting, not the back lighting. Not going to be obvious in daylight, but at nighttime, if you like to see some foreground lighting over this panel, that's what the outer knob is. Alright, aisle stand, panel, and flood. That's that center pedestal. So I'm going to run the outer ring, which is again the back lighting up. Let's see, we're all lit up here now. Beautiful. Alright, that's it upstairs for the uh, internal lighting. Let's go down here. On the captain's side, we have a panel. Let's run up the back lighting. Pretty much, I just run it to full on here. This is the foreground lighting. Uh, this is for your inboard and outboard displays here. Once here, you'll see that getting dimmer and brighter. I also like that pretty bright. And it's weird to leave the FOs off, at least for me. It's quite a few scrolls of the mouse to get that thing to move. Alright, I think that's uh I think that's it for interior lights. Okay, so if we're ready to taxi at this point, we can raise our viewpoint a little bit, kick the brakes off. While taxiing, the auto throttle can be activated. The transponder should go to TARA, but it's not going to let us. Alright, I think we've dealt with our lag. Quite honestly, I rarely, if ever, have to deal with that while flying. It's mostly when I'm recording. Uh, OBS just chews up enough system resources. That's very interesting. skip some of the taxi out, but we're going down to runway 08, 
towards the other end of this one. We're up here at 2.6. This is an extremely large aircraft, so you um, really want to think about your taxiing. All right, some other items we can handle at the moment. We can turn the packs back to normal. Hopefully I'm not driving off the run. Oh, there we go, taxiway, not runway. All right, we've uh, just about completed our taxi to runway 08. Get our takeoff clearance. Approaching zero eight. I'm going to turn on the outboard and inboard landing lights. And also the strobe is over there. I'm going to turn that on. will mention there's been some very uh, interesting ground handling properties if you're at a very low speed and you have the uh, tiller hard over nose wheels fully deflected one way or another sometimes it can start rolling back the opposite direction on while runway you're landing. zero eight and so uh, I don't recommend coming down to a complete stop and then trying to throttle up a little to just make a small correction. It just doesn't respond that well. Alright, so let's try a quick takeoff just so you can see the uh, autopilot being engaged here. We have speed brake retracted, the flaps are set at 5, oh sorry, we can go to idle on that. We have our external lighting set. We are not using that sim or anything, so I have no one to call for clearance. All right, last thing to do is start our clock. All right, clock is running. Bring the N1 up to about 60. On runway, zero, eight. On runway, zero, eight. It's just to let the power equalize in case uh, in the lower end, one of the engines hadn't spooled up as fast as the others. You wouldn't want asymmetrical thrust. From this thrust setting up, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the toga feature does not seem to function on here. I have a key set up with the joystick. I'm clicking it now. Nothing's happening. So I'm going to push the throttles up myself. And getting pretty hot on the exhaust gas temperature. Keep a little bit of an eye on that. Do not have the throttles firewalled. There, I've got us at 100%, and I believe it actually goes up to 107. You can see a V1, a V rotate do populate. Isn't that interesting? There's no real way to access that, so we'll start rotating here. Positive rate. Gear up. It's only a up-down gear position. There is no gear off. All right, we're over a thousand feet. I'm gonna clean it up and retract the flaps. Now that we are over that initial thousand feet. I'm going to turn on LNAV, VNAV, 
and hit command. All right, I'm hands off at this point. A couple things you'll notice. The speed indication on the mode control panel has snapped to 250. That came from here. It's in the climb profile. Speed altitude limit under 10,000 feet. It's also reflected here in the lakes page. Things you might notice about this climb. Look at that climb rate. It's absurd. That's uh, that's going to be a problem. All right, it won't let me go to speed or flight level change. Well, THR doesn't seem to do anything here, which is a little bizarre. Okay, that. Ridiculous climb rate is coming down and it's not stalling out. So I guess we're fine in LNAV. I'm sorry, I mean VNAV. Some nice Phoenix Ortho outside. This is an actual flight that goes uh, once, sometimes twice a day, I believe, between Heathrow and Phoenix. I live in the Phoenix area, so I watch Speedbird come over. As I understand it, they'll be retiring the 744 by about 2022. So uh, I'm trying to enjoy it while it while it's still here. Just a beautiful aircraft. Love to see it go over. I have a friend who frequently flies to London on business, and he uh, he no longer prefers British Airways because. Uh, Sadly, he says the 744s are starting to show their age inside. All right, we're over 10,000 feet now, so we can turn off those landing lights. We might uh, bong our cabin just to let the flight attendants know they can begin doing their thing. Just a note on this absurd climb in VNAV here. Uh, I think really what's happening is the default FMC has no idea it's being ridiculous. It knows there's this much power available. So we're basically at contingency power. N1 is at 107.4%. Exhaust gas temperature is in the red. We're melting the engines. and uh, But again, default FMC just knows it has that power available and so we are just climbing like a rocket when we do get to our set altitude oh nice it has snapped it to for me so I didn't even have to spin it when we do get to uh, flight level 330 it will go into sort of an auto throttle mode. I think it's going to click to uh, speed here, SPD, all by itself. And we'll hold altitude and speed on its own. All right, well, I think I've given you enough to really get started and to fly and operate the aircraft. It's going to follow this flight path. We might do some other videos on how to land, but basically the uh, default FMC is the same monster in all of the aircraft. There's just a little bit of variation in how the boat control panels function, but uh, you're, you're dealing with the same beast when you get down to this default FMC. So just in case you haven't already seen it, let's take a quick tour of our ship. Out the door. We have the upper deck. I've flown up here once. It's uh, it's quite interesting. Particularly during taxi, you're so high up in the air. It's almost like being in the terminal building. You're really looking down at other aircraft, and there is this enormous gap between seats and the wall. The one I was in had a a little cubby here you could put things in just to kind of fill the space and make it more usable. Behind this last seat is our staircase. You might want to pre-program some viewpoints 
two seats in the cabin so you can jump around without going for a full walk. Let's go up into the nose section. If you haven't already noticed the United markings, the default paint job on this is United Airlines. So the cabin pretty much reflects United. So we have the nice large first class seats <laughs> with Lufthansa uh, headrest covers. galley. If you use the uh, camera unlock the C button, you can use the arrow keys, period and comma, to actually go through the walls and enter the lavatories. They have uh, Austin, the X-Plane creator, in one of these lavatories. Kind of a funny little Easter egg tossed in there. You know, just trying to walk around with this uh, camera view, I'm holding shift. This is as fast as it goes. Uh, you really get an appreciation for just how large this aircraft really is inside. And here we have a rear galley. The uh, last time I was in the section of a 744, this was actually a bank of about I think they had squeezed in six or eight restrooms, and I think the galley they were using was the uh, pod style down in the cargo deck with an elevator. It was actually nice as a passenger, though, to have about eight restrooms available. Let's see how we're climbing. We are almost to our target altitude. Flight level 330. We're already at 2992, but we really should have switched to standard officially. That will again allow us to switch back. Alright, here we are. Let's see what's happened. It has switched to speed. It has switched to Mach numbers from indicated airspeed numbers, which is appropriate pretty much as soon as you're in the flight levels. You can see we're on course for uh, foothills, 44 nautical miles. All right, everything is operating as uh, as we expect and as it should. There's uh, Roosevelt Dam down there. All right, sim captains, I hope you've enjoyed this brief power up and departure of the Laminar Default Boeing 747 Model 400. As we always say at Flight Brothers, Plan the flight and fly the plan.